everyone to be please seated thank you now we'll start the event intelligence is what you have and analytics is what you do with it a very warm welcome to the honorable guests speakers delegates participants and organizers it gives us immense pleasure to introduce you all and welcome you all to this international conference on advances in business analytics the conference will provide a platform for dissemination of knowledge the theme for this year's annual conference is business analytics and its growing role in management decision making this theme has been selected after much deliberation as the trend is towards delivering massive amounts of data right here right now according to mckinsey the amount of data that is generated in the business world is doubling every year information from devices machines and social media is creating an entirely new set of challenges and reinforcing the fact that data will continue to grow exponentially very well said shivani so now like every event starts with the uh, worship of almighty we'll proceed towards the lamp lighting and uh, i request our honorable director sir dr dn mande distinguished professor dr devi singh dean research dr deepankar chakraborty and conference chair dr rahul singh to please come and invoke the ceremonial lamp also i request all the members to rise for saraswati vandana i request my colleague tanya to please uh, complement the light, uh, lamp lighting with singing saraswati vandana <laughs> I think it was a very warm start to the event. So uh, I request everybody to please take their seats. May I take the privilege to introduce you to our honourable director, Sir Dr. Dayanand Pandey, 
who is currently the professor and director of Jaipuria Institute of Management, Noida. He is the board member of Ames Guwahati. He was professor and director of School of Business at UPES Dehradun, Jinder Global School, Sonipat, IMT Dubai. He was a professor at IMT Ghaziabad, Bimtech, University of Wollongong in Dubai, SPJ in Dubai, Middlesex University, Dubai. So, I request you to please speak a few words about our campus and Jaipuria family that you've so dearly nurtured over these years. Good morning, everyone. Namaskar. Respected uh, Professor Devi Singh, our chief guest. For the occasion, Professor Pankaj Chandra, our guest of honor, distinguished Professor Pulak Ghos, our Dean Research of Noida Campus, Dr. Dipankar, members of the faculty, staff, and my dear students. Let me first welcome all of you for this international conference on advances in business analytics in collaboration with infinite sum modeling. It's a very difficult time. And normally, whenever we had to had a conference earlier, we had to do it in two auditoriums, Audi 1 and Audi 2, because of the students uh, coming to the conferences, guests coming to the conferences. This is for the first time we have a conference wherein we had to maintain the COVID protocol of social distancing. So we did not want many of the faculty, staff, students to be here on a physical mode. So this time we are doing on a dual mode. So this conference is live on Zoom and our chief guest Professor Chandra and our distinguished guest of honor, Professor Pulak Ghos, would be joining us from virtual mode. But I'm thankful to our mentor, guide, advisor, Dr. Devi Singh, who agreed to join on a physical mode. Thank you, sir, for being here today on a physical mode. Now about the conference title, Last year, we could not hold the conference because we had a plan to do it in the month of April. And everybody was struggling in the month of April, a lockdown, and there was hardly any uh, setup like Zoom, what is happening today. So we had to postpone it. This year, we had the chance to do it. So we are here today. Business analytics is a very important area. And I was reading the brochure prepared by our learned team, Dr. Dibankar, Dr. Rahul, Dr. Tavisi, and other members, student members and the faculty members. And I found one sentence which strikes me immediately, that business analytics is young and agile. I mean, when it comes to young, I reminded my own school days and college days, how young analytics is. And I have been a teacher of management of risk. Management of risk is primarily all about information and data analytics. I have been practicing it and without data analytics, without a set of information, risk can't be managed. So I've been practicing it for a long time. Secondly, being a student of economics, I read one paper written by three great economists, George Ekerloff, Spencer, and Joseph Stiglitz, way back in 1970. And the paper was a very prominent paper, I think all the faculty members who have got economics background probably, they must have gone through that paper. Our teachers used to ask us to go through it, not one time, several times. That was market for lemons asymmetric information. And that paper also got Nobel Prize in 2001. 
the idea of that paper was focused on information that if information is asymmetrical because i think all of you know that data is raw information is a processed item so when you process when you apply different tools and techniques into the data it comes to an information and that information becomes a valuable commodity the role of information in the market is extraordinary what that paper tried to show that if information asymmetry exists in the market because market is buyer and seller see if one party has got skewed information let's say sellers then buyers may be exploited in the market so if one party gets exploited because of information asymmetry then it leads to market failure why market failure because the purpose of market is efficient allocation of resources and goods and services and if information is asymmetrical between buyers and sellers then efficient allocation is bound not to happen that is what that paper proved so now it reminds me that data analytics which produces information was a science way back in 1970 in a very vibrant form many of my friends who have been pursuing marketing consumer behavior is all about information of the consumer you observe the consumer and then you collect the data analyze that data and then you can play around that data and make policies programs a strategy out of that data and information so to me data science data analytics is an old science it has come in a new avatar today i will not say that it is more of a uh, flamboyance around this world but yes it's important today because today's world because of the social media proliferation and people are more concerned about information and data this science requires to be learned as early as possible and i have a strong view that in the curriculum architecture of a b school business analytics or data science should be a core course and i will be fighting for this in our recent curriculum review that why can't we make data science because that makes students to learn the art and science of analyzing data processing information and making life better as i said about risk management when we have no information it's all about uncertainty so making any decision in uncertainty is always challenging then people believe in god enhances when you get some information that uncertainty translates into risk then people apply models and making decisions becomes easier and we have got a complete information with knowledge then risk becomes certainty and life becomes easy for all of us see the case of covid in the month of april may 2020 we had no information so lockdown all kinds of you know stress kya karna hai kya nahi karna hai kisi ko nahi pata tha jaise jaise data process hua people started getting information when we got information people started coming out they know that this is a disease if you want to not to spread it use mask maintain social distance don't touch anything you got information when you got information that uncertainty gets translated into risk so people became smart and today's time in many places people have stopped wearing mask i'm not saying it's a good idea but what happens now people know it's by and large it has become certain because we have got enormous amount of information about covid so this is how the importance of data information exists in every subject right so this conference actually focuses on that and i am thankful to the organizing team the students team who are contributing in this conference around this theme because that's the future that is where we all have to learn more and more 
There are a few important trends in analytics, which I have been observing as a student of management science and economics. Data is getting automated everywhere. So data automation is a regular feature. Artificial intelligence is widely used everywhere. I mean, I can see use of AI in many, many places. And hopefully the areas which are by and large, which can be automated nicely, that is automated nicely every day where human intervention is less required. Predictive and real time analysis has become the common practice in the industry. But one more thing has come, data discovery, right? I mean, data discovery is about also becoming extraordinarily powerful. If you have more data, more information, your power goes up. There are two issues which are areas of concern also. And I think this conference will focus on that also. Being a risk person, the one area which concern is data security. We are all worried because of fraud, because of problems in the society. And second is privacy, right? Each one of us want a privacy. I don't like when people of their private lives, they send many pictures on Instagram. I mean, like means what? I don't feel like doing it myself because it's my private life. I can show it to some of my friends, not to the entire world what I'm doing in my home. So this privacy issue is an issue for many people because systems can catch those data and can misuse that data against you itself. So these two areas of concern, what I've faced as a practitioner and also as a citizen of this global world. Hope the conference will focus on these and many relevant issues pertaining to data and analytics. I wish the conference a great success. And once again, thank our distinguished guest for gracing the occasion. Let me thank our chairman, Sri Sarat Jaipuriya, vice chairman, Srivas Jaipuriya, who have been a constant source of guidance and support to us in all endeavors, what we do in the campus. Thank you very much. Wish you all the best. May I now request you, sir, to please felicitate Dr. Devi Singh for the Green Certificate. As the Japuria tradition goes, this certificate implies that a beautiful tree has been planted in your name in the grounds of West Nyan Arunachal Pradesh. Yes. You. you can locate the tree uh, by the number mentioned on the survey. Thank you so much, sir. Now I request our director, sir, to please introduce and invite Dr. Devi Singh for the important. Every achievement uh, of any person needs to be celebrated. That's what I feel because every achievement comes with a huge amount of cost. Dr. Devi Singh is recognized as one of the top academic leaders in India. And I know him for more than 23, 24 years. He has been credited for transforming institutions of higher education. Flame University was a vice chancellor. He transformed into a university of choice for people. I am Lucknow. He was director for more than 10 years. I am Lucknow became in top Ivy League institutions in India during his time. He transformed MDI, Gurugram, as a director, he was there for four and a half years. So with this checkered strong career, Dr. Singh is a transformational leader. He has been, we are lucky that he has been a guide, mentor, advisor to all the faculty members in Japan. Dr. Singh was a visiting full professor at Faculty of Management, McGill University in Canada. He was a Ford Foundation and UNDP fellow. He had been a visiting faculty at International Center for Public Enterprises, Slovenia, SKK Graduate School of Business, Seoul. Rahulji, can you just maintain? Yeah. And uh, he has been a member of board in IIM Koji Code, Narsi Monji Institute of Management, Mumbai, Indian Institute of Mass Communications, New Delhi, NITI, Mumbai. So many things, if I read, Dr. Sir has asked me not to read, <laughs> but I'm just stopping here. He has been a great success and it's, it's an honor for us that he's with us. Thank you, sir. Please take the time.
Well, uh, thank you so much, Dr. Pandey, for such kind words. And I think my biggest success is that I have friends like uh, Dr. Pandey and uh, all of you. And I think that's what I want. Uh, uh, so thank you so much uh, for giving me this opportunity and uh, thanks for organizing such a wonderful uh, event, uh, Dipankar, uh, Rahul, and everyone else. Uh, as uh, Dr. Pandey said, uh, business analytics or data science is as old uh, as I am, you know, so you can get my, uh, <laughs> or as young as I am, you know, so uh, that's the way to look at it. Uh, I agree that uh, we have been using data for, for making decisions uh, as uh, as a uh, business uh, students as well as uh, uh, business leaders uh, and you know i'm reminded of this old saying by dale carnegie uh, that uh, we believe in god but everyone else must bring data you know is that right so data is something that uh, uh, and we have been using data looking at data uh, trying to understand data uh, we have been trying to, you know, replicate reality or trying to simulate reality using data by using uh, modeling, you know. So we have been trying to, you know, so it's old. Uh, you look at uh, various models. Uh, Pande talked about uh, finance. In finance, we often say the markets are efficient. Uh, and what does it mean? They are efficient because all information has already been processed and everybody has the same information and nobody can manipulate the price and price reflects all the information. Yet, information asymmetries do exist. And people make money out of mark market imperfections and out of these asymmetries. So we often say uh, that what can be measured can be managed. And that's true about risk. And that's true about every other business process. We have looked at uh, forecasting models uh, over a long time, uh, and then slowly the interest in forecasting models, uh, you know, waned because uh, we realized that forecasts are never uh, anywhere uh, near uh, uh, reality or uh, what. Uh, really happens on that particular day. That is true even for, you know, something like uh, forward rates, you know, forward rates, we work out very elaborately and yet uh, the spot rate or the actual rate will be so different. So that kind of situation exists. And therefore there is this struggle, how do we really comprehend, you know, this phenomena, and how do we use data once it has been cleaned up, it is available in a certain format. And uh, my friends like uh, Dipankar will use different, uh, you know, types of approaches to look at data, whether it's, you know, diagnostic or, you know, you want to just uh, prescriptive or, uh, you know, predictive or whichever you want to look at it. So data is something which has been growing for various reasons. The reason why we have so much of data because now it is easy to collect data and easy to process data. Because information technology and data science have moved in tandem. And it is the developments in information technology or technology that have enabled us to now grapple with large chunks of data and use analytics to, to get you know, insights into business processes. Look at my, you know, when I, I'm planning a strategy, when I'm looking at strategy, how do I use data and look at, you know, if we were to, if things were going to change in a particular way, how my strategy will have to be adjusted. So I think, so I'll use uh, examples from finance and economic, uh, finance and marketing, and so you'll see you for yourself, uh, how analytics has really made life in one way complex, in another way simpler. Uh, see, everybody struggles uh, to when it comes to, you know, especially when the business models are changing, how do you make adjustments? So if you look at finance, 
you look at uh, you know the, the, the major concern is how do i have a more predictable or accurate sales forecast or revenue forecast or cash flow forecast is that right the moment i talk about cash flows see the cash flows that we estimate at the time of when we are setting up the project or doing the investment uh, analysis is one way, but as reality unfolds, cash flow, uh, you know, cash flows in terms of what is going to become reality keep changing. So how do I really get a handle on that? The moment you bring in cash flow and revenue forecast, you cannot do it unless you look at who your clients are. So you do, you, you do a client level analysis, you do that product level analysis, you do at, you know, different business level analytics. And there's always, you know, uh, if you look at clients, uh, you know, utility companies, for instance, and phone companies have been using analytics for a long, long time. In fact, from 60s, not even 70s, from 60s. And they could predict, you know, how, how, how to get a new, subscriber and who's going to drop out from you know bell to at or to somebody else and they have been doing it like the, the mobile companies do it all the time they they, they use heuristics and they use uh, dynamic uh, modeling and they, they they are always looking at who are the people at the edge who may strip from airtel to vodafone or vodafone to airtel or or geo you know so this has been going on for a long time yet how do you bring some amount of, as Dr. Pandey talked about, certainty in your in your in your forecast becomes very very important because on cash flows will depend on your profitability. On profitability, profitability will depend on the the value of your firm, uh, uh, whether you do the EBA or other analysis. Or the value of the firm will depend the price of your stock will influence investors, and investors will look at the risk, and the risk is the that in terms of how volatile the revenues and the profits are for this company. So it becomes a complex, you know, set of uh, variables and parameters on which you have to continuously keep generating data and keep grappling with that and try to do some kind of internal. Every company tries to create a model of its own and try to look at that. This is the kind of market I operate. These are the external market forces. This is how the economy is going to grow. This is what the prime minister is saying. Our vision is for next five years. These are the kind of areas where more investments are going to come in. This is the kind of segment of population which will have uh, more purchasing power in their hands than somebody else. And all of this becomes so complex, so large. So we used to do macro economic modeling at one time, now macroeconomic modeling or the simultaneous equation in multivariate modeling, et cetera. Now it has become even more complex. So data is something that we have always been dealing with. Today with technology, today with the more predictive and uh, uh, quantitative tools uh, being available where computers can help, can can uh, handle thousands of variables at a time. And uh, we can deal with the, you know, billions of bits of data. All of this has become possible. And secondly, the data has become easier for us to, to collect. Earlier, it was not easy to collect because we could, I remember even in the 60s, we could have stock market data available hourly, daily, or you know, minute by minute, but no other data was available. Everything was collected either qual qual quarterly or uh, what you call yearly or on that basis. Today, data can be collected and, uh, you know, uh, stored in real time. And especially as Dr. Pandey talked about consum consumer based data, I think has become very, very significant for marketing people without looking at how consumers are feeling, look, continuously looking at their perception, uh, you know, uh, doing continuously perception surveys, looking at, you know, various, uh, you know, uh, various uh, 
initiatives and uh, groups created on uh, uh, social media. So I think dealing with consumer data has become even more complex because consumer data is not finite data. At times it is a perception data and dealing with perception data is even more difficult because you're looking at preferences when somebody will switch from one product to another, when somebody, the one brand will start you know, becoming more powerful than the other. How will, uh, you know, online business disrupt, you know, some of the retail uh, paradigm? All of this has become so complex. And how do you align, uh, you know, in terms of the product mix, uh, or let's say what you call the uh, marketing mix, and how do you spend your dollars in terms of doing different things? So efficiency of market is, uh, market, uh, 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 mix or what we call it, you know, I call it, uh, I use a term for that and that is, uh, see, uh, we say measure, analyze and manage. So, but you have to continuously keep looking at uh, consumer data uh, because it's not the, it's not technology anymore. It's not, you know, it's not also the design which will, you know, make you distinct uh, from everyone else. There are so many other things and it's the entire value chain that you need to continuously keep collecting data. So I think data science in, in, in that sense is new uh, or young where we never imagined that we'll have so much of volume of data to deal with. And we never imagined that uh, we will need such complex modeling, you know, to understand what actually is happening because real life cannot be easily modeled. And I often say that uh, we try to create, you know, try to run a regression analysis or do a, you know, a modeling exercise, try to replicate the uh, phenomena. But I think there are a lot of variables which are beyond that. And there are, and that's what I said, there are a lot of these perception, time-based, and some of the other variables that also needs to be important because it's, as we say, demand is a function of price, income, they, you know, your social status and all of that, but there are so many other variables that have come in and some, and now the, uh, the issue, the, the variables on wellness, you know, like Corona has now changed the way we think, the way we buy things and then the way we consume things, you know, suddenly health and wellness has become so much more important and now, Will this change uh, the, like somebody, uh, the imami has come out with a new cooking oil. You know, that's it. They, they are advertising that's an immunity and uh, the cooking oil that really good for you. So the, the entire product, let's say landscape is going to change because of what we have gone through in the last one year. Are we going to live differently and consume differently? How is travel? you know, and hospitality industry going to change because of, you know, this uh, this experience that everyone has gone through. And I'm sure there's some data available, but we need to generate a lot more data. And uh, this suddenly we are feeling much better uh, that as if the corona is over, what is the guarantee that something else may not hit us in the years to come? So is it going to change our lifestyles? Is this going to change the way we are you know, going to lead our life and the way we are going to work. We already know that we can work out of home and yet, you know, we can be as efficient and every company can save costs. Is this going to be the way? And how companies are going to, how is it going to affect the, uh, what you call the office space market? How is it going to affect the job market? Are jobs going to be full-time? Are jobs going to become cloud-based? Are we going to access talent based on what I need and you can help me and I'll pay you by the hour or pay you by the day or things are going to change. All of this will have to be looked at by people like the punker, model the behavior, use the existing data, do some diagnostic uh, kind of, uh, create some diagnostic kind of frameworks, use some statistical tools modeling and see which way we are going to move. So I think conferences like this uh, add value. Not that they train us in terms of what tools and techniques to use, but they makes us aware, it makes us conscious that uh, 
life with data the way data is growing is changing data has to be continuously used uh, you know even at the personal decision making because i can tell you i have members in my family who want decide even to buy a 100 rupee things unless they have done a lot of research and lot of data is available they not only compare prices but they compare features they compare warranties they compare you know uh, uh, consumer feedback they compare uh, you know reviews and i'm sure you and i do it all the time when we book a hotel so all of this data is available so based on that how do you reorient your marketing mix how do you reorient your market strategy i think all of this is becoming so so uh important and i'm sure uh papers that we are going to have in this conference in the next few uh, next few hours i think are going to give us insights in some of these areas so thank you once again uh, dr pandey dr uh, dipankar rahul and everyone else to think of uh, for thinking of a conference like this and organizing so beautifully thank you so much Thank you so much, sir, for those informative words, and thanks once again for being here and gracing us with your presence. May I now request the rector, sir, to please felicitate Dr. Pankaj Chandra with the green certificate. Thank you. Good morning, Dr. Pankaj Chandra. You are mute. Good morning to you. Good morning, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, Pankaj. Hi. Good morning, uh, Devi. So, uh, friends, Professor Pankaj Chandra is the Vice Chancellor of Ahmedabad University. He was the director of IIM Bangalore, two thousand seven, two thousand thirteen. He is a professor of operations and technology management at IIM Ahmedabad and IIM Bangalore. He holds a B.Tech from B.H.U. and phd from wharton school university of pennsylvania he was a full professor in university of geneva wharton school international university of japan cornell university remnin university beijing he was the first associate dean at isb hyderabad chandra was a member of government of india committee on rejuvenation of higher education yaspal committee that relooked at the indian higher education system as well as the committee on the autonomy of central institutions he was also a member of the telecom regulatory authority of india professor chandra's research and teaching interest include manufacturing management supply chain coordination building technological capabilities higher education policy and high tech entrepreneurship his recent book titled building universities that matter a study of issues of governance change and institution building in indian universities he serves on the board of several firms and institutions we are honored to have such a distinguished speaker in this international conference so chandra we thank you very much and we have a tradition of honoring our guest with a green certificate uh, we have stopped uh, bouquet physical bouquet to the guest uh, two years back this green certificate ensures that a tree is planted in your name so you can see on the screen a tree is planted in your name in west siam arunachal pradesh india and by clicking the link you can always see the growth of the tree once again sir thank you for coming to jaipuria noida and dais is yours sir thank you very much for the chief guest address thank you so much sir what thank you uh, uh, professor devi singh professor pandey for inviting me to come and speak to you um i i i think uh, you uh, congratulations for putting this phenomenal um conference together on a very important issue um relating around business analytics and 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 the world that is developing in a far more interesting um kind of way i uh, today want to make five points um um and as someone who has been trained and has worked in the domain of 
of modeling and analytics, um, I'm going to take a little bit of a different position than what I um, um, have done in, in much of my research in the past. And, and this is just to uh, start a conversation around, uh, around the world of analytics and what it is changing and, and how should we go about addressing it slightly differently. The first point is a cliche that I just want to put it on the table. Um, data is the new fuel, you know, it is, uh, uh, it's the new driver of much of engine of economy and growth. And, but the question is, um, we've not been able to answer very well, what is the vehicle which uses this fuel? You know, um, many a times we think it, uh, this vehicle are the methods and much of our energy goes in developing the methods. Um, and, but, but, the, um, but the question is, is method the engine um, that drives the vehicle or are the models of reality really that engine that drives the reality? So in my mind, that vehicle is our business applications and, and the broader software that drive them that represent models of reality. So that's point number one. Point two is, you know, um, I, 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 um, most people uh, would like to believe that enterprises want to know when customers are buying, what is it that they are purchasing, um, and, and so on and so forth. But in my mind, the question which is far more pertinent is why is a customer buying what she's buying? And more importantly, why is a customer not buying something that she's not buying? Um, because it's an answer to this question lies um, the growth and the future possible opportunities. Now, which essentially means that um, consumer psychology and behavioral decision-making actually overlay on, on data and analytics in a far bigger way than what we have managed to explore, and especially in our country. Um, data in itself is the fuel, but you know, whether it's a fuel in a large tank, if you may. But it is this vehicle, uh, which is our understanding of the reality, um, which makes us go places, which tells us where to go, how far you can go. Um, and I think it's this, um, it's this issue of consumer insight, in my mind, or insight in general, um, that makes the world of analytics and particularly business analytics come more alive. Um, unfortunately, much of the practitioners in many of our academic settings see these as two different worlds. My job is to develop methods and someone else's job is to use the methods to be able to draw insights um, in, a, in a far more comprehensive manner. And I'll give a couple of examples as we, as we go along. The third point that I would want to make is, um, you know, I, I believe business analytics must move away from the world of data mining, data organization, storage, and so on and so forth. But um, a far deeper understanding of data to help us understand complex problems and, and then discover solutions to them. You know, we have to ask ourselves this question. Uh, you know, a few days ago, I'm sure you may have seen, some of you may have seen this, um, this photo that was being flashed all over the world um, about SpaceX launch, you know, Elon Musk's uh, rocket, reusable rocket. And if you remember, if those of you who saw it, the rocket is reusable, which means 
in by the way most other um, uh, rocket launching systems when the rocket comes back it is burnt here is an experiment which is saying i want to launch a rocket bring it back and reuse it so this this on this particular day the rocket launched successfully the rocket came back to its pod successfully but then it blew up and now if you ask if, if i'm a manager um, managing that business and it's a business a commercial business that they are wanting to launch and if i want to ask this question i'm not going to worry about where is my data organized how it is organized that's for some others to essentially do it but as a manager i want to know really what triggered this blow up it's a very simple kind of question and i would like then to find out you know um um uh, if um if my data my sensors my tracking of everything else that goes with this technology actually allows me to answer that question so the point i'm wanting to make is that ability to ask a sharp question is as important if not more than the data itself and analytics must allow us to ask sharp questions if we can't allow if if it doesn't allow us to ask sharp questions then i think we have missed um um missed uh, um the power of this data and its ability to answer questions for us so you can see you know most practitioners and and academics around business analytics as i said see themselves as a methods people or methods area that improves our ability to sort and sift and and align data better in a way where you could see things um or but i think a more powerful role for business analytics is to be able to um use these methods this ability to sharpen the question that we can ask and if we can progressively ask sharper and sharper questions then in some ways we are on an like a on a ai assembly line you know i feed the data i train the model it improves it generates more data then i feed it further so it's as if you are on a plane with multiple algorithms multiple things stacked up one above another with the sole purpose of allowing me to sharpen my 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 questions and and as soon as we we see this i think the role of business analytics changes very dramatically it moves beyond a method it moves beyond organizing data which are very disparate from various sources uh, and then it aligns or in some ways merges very strongly with the functions of an organization whether you are as professor singh was pointing out whether you're sitting in a trading room um you not distinguish yourself distinguishing yourself from a trader to a uh, an analytics person i think it's part and parcel of your own thinking makeup the fourth point that i want to make is um you know the search for digital truth is becoming now very crucial and organizations and individuals are starting to ask this question if there is a single version of truth you know or what is the way in which accurate data um uh, or um uh, can be um uh, uh, what are the ways in which data can be seen as accurate especially when they are coming from multiple sources now you know um uh, uh, uh more than a century and a half ago when um actually more slightly more than even more than that um when the when electricity replaced steam engine um then all the machines that used to be grouped in a factory next to the steam engine because that's where it was drawing the source of power and it had to be there now got distributed 
So you could generate electricity at one location and you could run your machine at spatially and geographically distant and dispersed locations. And that completely transformed really the way the engine of economy work because growth happened in a, in a very big way. Now, interestingly, I feel that the reverse of that is happening now with data. The machines of this digital age, which are these business applications and softwares that run um, or that build these applications, they are all working around uh, centralized new power sources or data lakes, if you may, you know, I mean, they're all together, whether it is the cloud or whether it is somewhere else, that world is getting centralized. Now, um, it's very interesting um, because if the power source is getting, decent, is getting centralized and the machines are still getting distributed, then looks like because of this data centralization, there's a possibility that companies can actually create twins of themselves, which means that companies can create models, ways of doing and replicate their own way of functioning uh, from a data perspective that much more easily than what they would. So at, at, at this, um, and I also feel that integration of data as Professor Singh was pointing out a few minutes ago, which is still an issue, but it is becoming better. And it may be possible, as I said, to have an AI assembly line um, with such data repositories that are centralized, which will train algorithms in a far better way, more rapidly, with shorter cycle times on improvements. And, and that actually will lead to insights that are coming in real time, insights that are quicker, insights that can be possibly more, more diverse. Now, I, I mean, think about it in this way. I've, I'm, a, I'm a retail company. And the question that this retail business asks, um, and, and especially in this uh, pandemic and post pandemic time now is, how do I present a single face to a customer, you know, where the customer recognizes offers and perhaps to some extent experience, which is similar, whether this customer uh, is shopping online or in store. It's actually a, a phenomenal business analytics question, but it is as much a question of, um, of, of data, as it is a question of neuroscience, as it is a question of, of consumer psychology, as it is a question um, associated with, uh, with drawing um, mechanisms and design, designing experience that are different. So it's, it's kind of all of them are, um, are, are merging where while companies are wanting to have a single face of truth, it's still a little bit at a distance. And, and so the question and the point I'm wanting to make is that data and the methods must be questioned. Because if we don't question them, these issues of, of digital truth, of single face of, a, of data and, and single version of truth and things of that kind will continue to haunt us in organizations which will, um, despite the centralization of, of data, uh, find results which are disparate from one function to another. It's no longer, it's still not helping us coordinate functions better. And it's actually the role of business analytics to use data and use it in a way where it helps making complex decisions in a far more coordinated and better manner. Uh, so I'm, I'm, I'm actually arguing for a different role for a business analyst than just crunching some number for someone else to interpret. And I, I think it's, a, it's an 
if that's a point I'm, I'm, I'm making here. The last point that I want to make um, is about business analytics and social sciences. You know, most practitioners of business analytics come from backgrounds in statistics, operations, OR, computer science, math, applied math, and so on and so forth. Uh, but they fail to engage with social sciences, which essentially can help them with new application domains, but more importantly, provide them with consumer insights, which is the holy grail. I mean, the holy grail in the world of business is to be able to understand what, why is a consumer doing what she is doing? Why is she investing in a certain portfolio? Why is she, what are some, um, some data plus some behavioral traits that are defining somebody's um, actions in the marketplace in a certain way. Now, without bringing in consumer psychology, as I said, or neuroscience or sociology into data analytics um, around development of business insight, it will be nay impossible to be able to realize the potential of these methods, of these tools and techniques. So whether one is a CIO or an aspiring one, or whether one is a supply chain manager, or whether one is a market researcher or financial analyst, I think one needs to bring behavioral sciences to deeply enmesh with data science and analytics therein. And I want to read a paragraph for you um, from Economist um, in their August 7th 2019 issue. Um, so here is Susan Sontag, who's, who's a writer um, and a feminist, said something very interesting. She understood that photographs are unreliable narrators. And I'm not talking about new, new type of data. So she goes on to say something very interesting. She says, and I quote from Economist, Despite the presumption of veracity that gives all photographs authority, interest, seductiveness, the work that photographers do is no generic exception to the usually shady commerce between art and truth. And I end the quote here. And it's a very powerful statement you know you know what but what if even the presumption of veracity disappears because as soon as you see a photo you see it as truth and as data it's a very strong data to us so today the events get captured in realistic looking or sounding videos realistic sounding videos and audio recordings, which need not have ever happened. They can instead be generated automatically by powerful computers and machine learning software and AI systems and so on and so forth. And the catch all terms for these computational production is deep fake. The question I ask is, you know, as data moves from becoming, from being numbers to photo and sound and many other things, you know, these deep fakes are going to give us multiple versions of truth, which are going to make analytics, outcomes of analytics about the Holy Grail, which is the insight that much more complex. And businesses now have to use analytics far more carefully now than ever before, not only to make better and correct decisions, but also to eliminate deep fakes in data 
that can get their models, their AI algorithms that go completely haywire, but more importantly, much to the detriment of organizations and to the society at large. So I'm arguing for a, a serious responsibility on the shoulders of those who, um, who collect and manage and analyze data or build models around it to be able to engage with many other domains that will help them understand better about some of these dark pits that are starting to appear in this new world of technology that is starting to drive businesses. And businesses will go under for these very reasons and not necessarily for lack of a better strategy or anything else, but because we do not have the digital truth around the data that we're talking about. And all the edifice that we've built upon it will possibly be built on absolutely sand and gravel rather than on steel and mortar. And that is the big challenge before um, the larger um, uh, um, analytics and tech community today. As the world and our society evolves into a far more algorithmic society moving forward. So with these words, I, uh, I thank you for giving me this opportunity for uh, sharing some of these thoughts and, and hopefully your conference will not only be, uh, be able to provide some light and thoughts on some of these questions for which I at least don't have answers, um, but uh, many in the world are struggling today and perhaps open up new domains of research uh, for uh, business analytics professionals and, uh, and academics in our country. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir, for such an inspiring, a very interesting speech. You talked about difficult and sharp questions. The most intriguing one was the digital truth, which all of us are struggling to find out in the market. And I think one thing which strikes me brilliantly about more than one truth, uh, that's what we all struggle in life and data and methods must be questioned. Otherwise it will lead us to a wrong direction. Business analytics must collaborate with social science and humanities to make it more meaningful. And last, what you said is that the responsible use of business analytics and data science. So with these uh, important messages for all of us, thank you, Professor Chandra, for being part of this conference. And we're all honored to listen to you. Thank you very much, sir. Pleasure. Thank you very much. Uh, may I request Dr. Pula Ghos, sir, please, are you there? Can you? Yes, Pulak. Welcome. Thank you very much for coming to this conference. Hi, Danan. Hi, hi, Pulak. Hi, Pankaj. Hi, Pulak. Pulak. Good to see you after a long time. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Pulak, Dr. Devi Singh is here. Can you see him? I think he is saying hi yeah. to you. Hi, Dr. Devi Singh. Hi. So, Pulak, first let me uh, welcome you to this conference and uh, let me honor you with you with a, a green certificate, Pulak, because uh, we stopped for our guest bouquet and we can't give you bouquet in, in this time of difficulty also. So this green certificate is an initiative by which a tree is planted in your name and it is displayed on the screen. The tree is planted in West Siang in Arunachal Pradesh. So please accept it, Dr. Pulak, uh, this Thank green you. certificate. Thank you. Friends, uh, Professor Pulak Ghos is a professor of decision sciences at IIM Bangalore. His key areas are in interaction of big data, machine learning, AI, and its use in economics, finance, policy, and social value creation. He did serve in the editorial board of prestigious Journal of the American Statistical Association, 
Journal of the Royal Statistical Society, and currently serves in the editorial board of the most prestigious biometrics. Based on his outstanding and innovative contribution to research, the International Indian Statistical Association awarded him with the Young Scientist Award in 2011. Government of India awarded him the prestigious C.R. Rao Award in 2015. And again, the most prestigious Econometric Society awarded him the Mahalanobis Award in 2016. Prior to joining IIM Bangalore, he served as Associate Director, Novartis Pharmaceuticals USA, faculty in Georgia State University and Associate Professor at Emory University in USA. He's a visiting professor in many international institutes of repute and he has served in Niti Aayog, government of Karnataka, and many banks and many organizations helping them in business analytics and in data science. So formally, I welcome Professor Pulak Ghos, and I request every one of you to listen to him very, very carefully. His every sentence will give you lots of insight. Thank you, Pulak, and now Dias is yours. Thanks, Danan. Thanks to all. Uh, so although it's kind of uh, the name of the conference is International Conference of Business Analytics, uh, let me play the devil's advocate. The whole term of business analytics is slowly going and data science is taking over. Even data science is slowly moving and what is taking over nowadays, both in industry, advanced industries, as well as in academics is something what we have started calling uh, computational social science. Uh, the reason why I'm saying computational social science, because initial days, the euphoria of business analytics was there because majority of the industries had a lot of data and they never used it. So whatever they have done on that data, some insight came and they were very happy about it. But as time passes by and they are looking for more insight, they realized that the incremental benefit is very minimal because of a lot of constraints in terms of data science. And the major problem I'll come to that is you have to understand analytics as a smaller world and data science as a bigger world is an exceptionally interdisciplinary subject. And it's a very, very new phenomenon. Uh, I say it very, very new phenomenon, not from the point of view of new modeling, but from the point of view, people are for the first time trying to understand where it doesn't work, why it doesn't work, how to interpret it, and a lots of those issues, right? Uh, for example, uh, you may have heard a lot about machine learning and at the same time, statistical learning. Now, both the methodologies are very, very old. Statistical learning probably a little bit more old than the machine learning. But the problem people have now is, yes, I can use machine learning, but we don't know how to interpret it because it is not based on solid theoretical background like a regression does. So an output from a regression is very easy to interpret. You can communicate it to the manager or to the you know, uh, stakeholders, but an output from, from a machine learning is very hard to interpret. So that's what I'm saying that it's becoming very, very interdisciplinary. Now, Computational social science, because every aspect of social science is becoming heavily data-oriented, empirics-oriented, computational-oriented. Economics, I mean, I don't know how many of you know, the Harvard Department of e Economics has redesigned their entire economics curriculum. And the first year, they don't learn any sort of economics. Everything they learn is coding, statistics, and machine learning. That's all they learn, right? Why? Because they think the future of economics is heavy computation. So now the question comes that there is a lot of euphoria about this business analytics. And I guess you get to know in every time you get to a, do a project or be in a classroom, you always listen about the advantages of business analytics. What I will try to uh, introduce you to the issues with analytics and we have to careful about there. So for example, uh, the major advantage of what people move analytics is about prediction. 
Now, as I said, interpretability of the algorithm is the biggest challenge in today in analytics world or data science world. Why do I say that? So let's take an example. So there is this big retail company, Amazon. Two years back, uh, so one of the problem with you know these companies like Amazon or Flipkart or of the world is that how fast you can actually make the product available to the consumer. So basically, can I reduce the time from the consumer order something to your doorstep? Can I reduce that time, right? So most of these online retailers, their major research R&D goes in reduction of this time. Now, one of the big component of that, solving that puzzle is, can I predict pin code wise, what product are going to be sold in next one month. Now, if I can solve this puzzle with a sufficient accuracy, then I can solve the puzzle quite a bit because I will have my warehouse, you know, those kind of stocks, right? So far, the problem is very simple. Now, majority of the online retailers have been trying to solve it and their success rate is around 13%, 14%. Then two years back, there has been a huge algorithmic you know, explosion by combining Bayesian time series, deep learning, combining you know, a big model. And Amazon declared that they have kind of solved the problem because the success rate is now 78%. And these papers were presented almost in every conferences. The team who has worked with it has been felicitated. Everything is fine, except after six to seven months, Amazon realized Although the algorithm is predicting well, their return on the investment from the algorithm is actually not growing. Now the question is, here is a machine learning algorithm after a lot of research predicted damn well, but it's not helping the business. So what exactly happened? So problem happens is that the 78% accuracy actually happened on the heavily moved goods. So for example, here is the fin code out of the 100 product in this pin code there is 78 products which almost everybody buys every week but what the company actually wants is the high ticket item the tail area item high ticket item which doesn't move that fast the prediction of that because that's what the business is so here the problem is that although 78 percent is a very high accuracy compared to 13 or 14 percent it's predicting something which the company has no use of because I already know that the people will buy salt. I already know people will buy rice. I already know people will buy uh, dal, right? What I need to know, is this pin code going to buy thousand refrigerator this week? And this algorithm is not being able to solve that problem because the tail area, the data is heavily sparse, right? So, so this is one example where I'm trying to show you that prediction is great but interpretability of the result is even more important for the society and for the companies, right? The second example, we keep on saying we have too much data, lots of data, and so we should be in a very good hands in terms of business analytics. The answer is mixed, yes or no. If you want to do something extraordinary, no. If you want to do something very minimal, yes. There are also becoming, because of this AI, which I will touch in a minute, because of this AI movement, automated movement, we are also getting to a territory where we may not have the data we need. To give an example, few years back, I was being flow, flown to China uh, to a car company manufacturing unit. When I gone to that manufacturing unit, what I found is there is no light. Forget daytime, there is no light even in the night. Entire manufacturing unit is just robots moving around, no human touch. And the robots has three kinds, two kinds of light. One is red, one is green. Green means the robot is functioning fine. Red means the robot is actually malfunction. Now the company actually wanted me to solve the problem by saying that once the robot is malfunctioned, it costs a lot of money, not only to make it function, but also the amount of day work this robot is getting lost. So can you develop a predictive algorithm which will tell me when a robot is, has a high probability of malfunction? 
Now, when I was exposed to the problem, I'll be honest, out of sheer arrogance and overconfidence, I thought, why they are pampering me so much for solving such an easy problem, right? Because there has been predictive maintenance problem has been there for a long time. But then within a day, I realized this is probably one of the hardest problem I need to solve. Why so? Think about the problem. When the robot is functioning, I have data. When the robot does not function, I do not have the data from that robot. But if I give a job to a human under exceptionally same circumstances every day, the output of the human is going to be variable every day. It's not exactly same. And the entire analytics, machine learning, statistical learning depends on this variation because all we try to do is reduce this variation. But come to the robo. When the robo is functioning, if you give a job to perform under the same circumstances, every day the output is exactly same, which means the variance is zero. If the variance is zero, how you are going to develop predictive algorithm because it's math, it's no longer data. This data having millions of observation is same as having just one observation because they are all same numbers, right? So how do you solve this? This is a very complicated problem. So we solved it later on, but I'm just trying to come to a point that, you know, we are getting into a very, very complicated interdisciplinary arena of analytics. Within next five to seven years, you will see the face of analytics, which you haven't heard, right? So this is one thing. The second bit of problem of analytics, and I'm focusing more on that side problem because that's where the interests are nowadays, be it academic, be it big industry-wise, right? For example, when I say computational social science, you'll be very surprised, or maybe you already know, that the top technology firms are hiring three times more non-engineers than engineers, be it Google, be it Facebook, be it Amazon, be it Microsoft, they are hiring more statisticians, more economists, more psychologists. Why? Because their point is that I can hire 10 engineers and they can run millions of models, but I need a lot more than engineers to interpret those results. And that's where the behavioral angle comes in. And behavior is best understood by the social scientist, right? So this is what I meant by computational social science becoming extremely, extremely important. Let's come to the other phase of analytics or machine learning algorithm, right? One of the biggest challenges today, particularly for the regulator in the financial industry of use of machine learning is something called fairness. I have used a model, but is this model telling me the truth I want. For example, let's say I'm a fintech company and this fintech company, what they do is they give loans, right? So I want to print based on, let's say I have given loan to 100,000 customer. Out of this 100,000 customer, 10% were default. Now a new person comes in and I use train my machine learning model and I decide, okay, I'm going to give loan to this part, new person. Up to this is great. This person probably won't default. So you come back to your manager and say, well, you know, my machine learning predicts really, really well, but had it. Why? Because it may happen that the data you train on the machine learning algorithm is heavily biased. Heavily biased of what? Heavily biased on gender, heavily biased on financial inclusion, heavily biased on caste. What do I mean by that? Maybe while you are actually giving the loan, you cautiously didn't give loan to many females. You cautiously didn't give you know, a loan to lower caste. You cautiously didn't give loan to people applying from the poverty area, right? So what happens then when you train your machine learning algorithm, that algorithm carries forward that bias and in future, using that algorithm, you end up giving more to non-female, you end up giving more to higher caste, you end up giving more to people from high uh, you know, income region. Basically what that means is your algorithm is doing a great injustice to the society, right? So how do you solve this problem? So machine learning in fairness and bias 
is a big, big uh, problem in today's world, right? The third thing I wanted to say is AI. Now, when I come to AI, let me see if I can share the screen. Uh, can I be, can the host give me a sharing access? Can you guys see my screen? Yeah? You can see, right? Oh, okay. Fine. Okay. So now I come to the part of AI. Now, you all know what is AI. It's basically an output mimicking the human behavior based on certain input and some intelligent thinking. That's no, no brainer. The question is why we are getting into this now. We're getting into this now because now I have lots of data and I have large scale computing. When I say large scale computing, not the existing one, but we need to wait for uh, quantum computing. But what I want to uh, introduce you guys to is actually why does AI matter so much? Well, it doesn't matter to our lives that much now, but it's going to matter in down the road, right? Because it's affect our business. On top of that, it affects our lives and affects our society, right? So this is the biggest thing. And in AI, here are the three states. ANI, AGI, ASI. So ANI is something called artificial narrow intelligence where we are right now. AGI is artificial general intelligence where we are pushing to be. And ASI is artificial super intelligence when machine is way more smarter than you, right? So, you know, ANI is just specialized in one area, all right? I'll not spend much time, but basically I'll try to introduce you to this concept and AGI is where you can do multiple things. For example, um, this um, Alexa of Amazon is one of the very primitive example of AGI. And your ASI, artificial super intelligence is smarter than humans in every way. This is where we are going to get to and this is why we need to think about. So they generally people in the AI or analytics region, this is what we say that we are in ANI right now, then we are going to get to AGI and around 2060 probably we'll get to the ASI. But one thing is because of COVID, almost every big farm, including you know, different countries are pushing hugely and investing hugely on, on digital and AI systems. And so this may, uh, prepone actually, right? Now, from ANI to AGI, basically we need to build computers which can process large amount of data very fast, right? And that's where quantum computing is going to come because quantum computing, what it takes maybe a few days to compute, quantum computing will probably do it in a few seconds. But this also brings the problem because if quantum computing comes, the way you do your password that is gone because I can crack your password in fraction of a second, right? Now, generally, there has been a heavy amount of investment of AGI, which is artificial general investment. And as you can see, the SoftBank basically say that this is the future and that's why they are building a $100 billion tech fund. Now, from AGI to ASI, artificial super intelligence, this is the road. Right now, we are somewhere in the middle because between ANI and AGI. And once we reach to AGI, the movement to ASI will be exponential. We'll just jump because we probably solve most of the problems we, we can solve right now. Remember, as of today, the real trouble of full AI 
is the emotion and intelligence. So machines are as intelligent as you want to be. Machines are not intelligent on its own. That's the problem. And with that, we need the emotional part of human. That's where ASI is going to come because it's a multi emotion is a multidisciplinary uh, thing. But the you know generally in machine learning we divide it in three parts. One is supervised, unsupervised, and another is reinforcement learning. But reinforcement learning only works in, in in a finite domain. That's why you see in chase, reinforcement learning works very good, and a machine can beat a human. Why? Because num pot potential number of moves in a chase are large but finite. And because it's finite, machine can all the machine doesn't know is how good or bad you are. And in few movements of yours, the machine get to learn how good or bad you are. And from the entire domain of possible movement, they can pick up which one to do to beat you. But the moment it is infinite, then reinforcement learning, we don't know how it works. And that is one of the reasons why driverless car is still far away. Because in driverless car, I cannot feed finite amount of situation. There are situations when the machine has to look at it and learn on so It cannot just I do on a feeding way, right? Now, let's say ASI comes, artificial super intelligence come. What happens? Now here are the three stalwarts. They all say, this is not a great thing. It can be a biggest threat. Yes, it is. Like any technological innovation has its threat. But if done properly, then that's when we can solve lots of lots of problems, starting from disease cure to solving uh, energy, right? For example, Elon Musk launches Neuralink. That's pretty much says that can, what I need to do on human brain to compete with ASI? People don't know, but he's trying to do that. Coming back, these are the 10 building blocks of AI. And this is going to make AI go to ASI. As you can see, some of them we know a lot. Some of them we practically don't know anything. For example, image analysis, we have no clue whether a, a picture is right or wrong. Uh, knowledge engineering, we know a little bit. Robotics from a technology point of view, we know. But from emotional point of view, we have no clue. NLP beyond English is pretty, pretty primitive, right? Same as cognition. That's where we have no clue. But all of these 10 blocks, when it gets to a very high level of sophistication, we get to the A side. So what I'm coming at the end is, the machines are coming, no to have, you cannot avoid it. So it's better to ride the train than jump, but there are lots of lots of issues which you need to resolve as we move forward, as I said in the beginning. So we have to embrace analytics right now with a lot of pinch of salt, question a lot the findings, revise your model, see if the interpretation is making sense and then accept it. Don't just blindly do prediction and jump on it. I'll stop here. Thanks, Pulak. Uh very intense, intellectually stimulating. I just understood a few things to share my friends here that Department of Economics in Harvard has changed all things. Now it's all about data science. I think it's a Abhijit Banerjee effect, perhaps for luck, right? I, because I he's the first economist who got the prize based on the data science. Now, the second thing which you told us is about interpretability of results is more important than predictions because you have a predictions, but how did you interpret the results? And third thing you said very nicely is about importance of social scientists, because they are the one who bring the insight in analytics and data science. One important thing you talked about and which we have struggled, I read one article long back in risk management from Harvard Business Review, that was about fairness, rational behavior and fair process, which is more important. So People prefer fairness than rationality because rationality is maximizing, but fairness is justice. Justice is more important than equity, what people believe in. So I think I agree with, I mean, I strongly believe in this, that the fairness in this area is important and how to remove the bias. The last one was very frightening when I saw this slide from AGI to ASI was evolution of AI. 
And very frightening by 2060, what you saw that rationality exists in AI, emotions will come, but I don't know how far AI will bring intuition because humans have got intuition, which is beyond rationality and emotions. So anyway, uh, thank you very much, Pulak, for joining this uh, important conference today and uh, telling us and enlightening us about various important aspects of business analytics and data science. We are honored and thank you for being part of this inaugural session. Thank you very much. Thank you, Danan. Thanks a lot. Ivanka, please come for the vote of thanks. Satender and the team of IT, amazing work, very seamless transition from you know, face to face to online. So thank you very much. Tomarji, thank you very much for thank COVID you. protocol in, the, in this, this area now. Thank you. Please come. Oh, what an amazing uh, start to the uh, conference. Such a vast area has been covered in such a short time. And it really gives us a wonderful uh, canvas. And I really feel privileged to be, you know, proposing the formal vote of thanks for this uh, session. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Pankaj Chandra, for actually setting out the big canvas for us and letting us know that what are the macro issues that, you know, involve the analytics area. And thank you to our guest of honor, uh, Dr. Pula Ghosh, for you know, bringing out the micro issues and the challenges that, that we have to really look forward to when it is coming to you know, the analytics and the use of analytics. And uh, Dr. Pandey has rightly said that it is the prediction versus the interpretability that would matter in, in the you know, days to come. And that's where we have to actually all move around. And that's where the research has to be a part of it. Uh, well established that the, there is an importance of analytics and it's going to be uh, a fact that we're going to have and also that it is possible today. Uh, so Dr. Devi Singh, he's making it that yes, analytics is possible and we can all get into doing that analytics, you know, in whichever way that we are doing and maybe enhance from wherever we are, you know, there. So thank you all these speakers in the morning today. You know, it's been really great that, you know, they go there was such a wonderful canvas in which we could really look around and see that you know there's a lot to learn from it, a lot of food for thought for us. And we have to really believe that the machines are coming and we all have to gear up to get onto that machine and have a wonderful ride on those machines. That is what was really established very well. Thank you very much for this speakers who actually do that. <laughs> I will, yes, I will actually, my vote of thanks will not be complete if I do not, you know, propose a vote of thanks for some of the very key for people who have been associated with this conference and making it happen. Uh, my special thanks to our chairman, uh, Sri Sharad Jaipuriyaji and the vice chairman, Sri Srivats Jaipuriyaji for always being a support and an encouragement for us to do events of this kind which stimulates our intelligence and stimulates us to think about and, and take forward you know, into the body of knowledge and contribute to the body of knowledge. Uh, we definitely like to thank Dr. Dian Pandey for you know, being an inspiration behind all of us to actually you know, uh, do these events you know, and, and invite people and participate in a big way. Uh, I would also fall short if I'm not that vote of thanks to the track chairs uh, we're going to have a few tracks here, three tracks post this uh, inaugural session. Uh, they have come from different areas. There is somebody from Thailand, Bangkok, uh, you know, managing the time difference, and they're going to be a part of the uh, conference, and they're going to be, you know, uh, being a session chair for that. So uh, thank you for those uh, session chairs, you know, who are going to be a part of the tracks that we're going to follow the, the inaugural part. Uh, then, of course, you know, the uh, conference conveners, uh, Rahul and uh, Tavishi. Uh, for the last three months, they've been absolutely running here and there, despite the kind of challenges that we've been having in terms of, you know, uh, the, the COVID and, and, and the movement restrictions that we had to put this together here. And I think they, they deserve a big round of applause for what they have done. And, uh, and, certainly, and certainly, you know, I, I will fall short again if I will not do uh, appreciate the effort of our Dean Administration, Dr. V.K. Tomar, for standing by every moment with his team of people, which includes Kanchan, which includes the, you know, the IT team, which includes every other person here, 
to have actually put together uh, as as dr pandey said seamlessly you know getting the whole event happened without any technical glitches it is generally a customary thing that happens in most conferences is the technology tends to fail but here we have set an example that the technology does not fail in crucial even i think the it team did also a big hand you know for for, for this and again uh, the audience has been wonderful audience they've been here listening to us so patiently since the morning and i'm i'm sure they would have really absolutely learned a lot in in whatever has been spoken now right thank you very much for our wonderful audience here and last but not the least these two wonderful ladies they have really done such a wonderful thing and and thank you very much they have actually brought the level of a conference to a different height thank you very much thank you very much and uh, we will now move towards the uh, the sessions and uh, we'll have a small break for about 5 10 minutes and then move forward thank you all thank you very much